Hey, man. All right, Gary, how's it going? Good. How's your day going? Uh, it's all right, man. I'm tired. I just got done battling traffic for two hours. So I'm going to have a make a sandwich and have a beer and chill out. <laughs> I hear you, really. Uh, so you ready to go? Mm-hmm. All right, my friend. Uh, so these are going to be, you know, basically the uh, the same thing that I asked you last time. Uh, we're going to go ahead and do it again because uh, of the technical difficulties that we had. So, uh, all right, question number one. Uh, before being put on the Christopher Wallace case, uh, did you ever hear about the – did you ever hear about Russell Poole? And if you did, what did you think about him? No, I didn't have any, like, uh, experience with him or I never worked with him. I didn't really know the guy, so until I got put on the case and had a chance to kind of evaluate his role in the whole thing, I didn't know anything about him. Okay. Um, did you, uh, when you were on the case, uh, you know, when you were on the Tupac case, did you ever get to see the uh, uh, the MGM tapes of Trayvon Lane actually whispering into Tupac's ear, or like they say, whispering into his ear? You still there? Oh yeah, hello. Yeah, I think you cut out for a couple of seconds. Oh, okay. Can you repeat, repeat the question? Yeah, um, when you were on the uh, Tupac is, did you ever see when uh, Trayvon Lane whispered into Tupac here on the MGM tapes? No. Okay, no. Uh, the, all right, uh, Eugene Dio has been talking again. Uh, this time he's saying that uh, you or someone on your team showed him a picture of uh, him and the uh, so-called Muslim guy that he claims uh, appeared to him the night that Biggie was murdered. Uh, is this true? And if so, who is that man? Yeah, so it wasn't me. And it was, you know, this incident you're talking about took place back during the original investigation in 1997. And, um, you know, they were showing Eugene Deal a, what we call a photographic lineup at Six Pack and one of the photos and it was just a randomly selected photo with the you know, nobody related to the case in any way, shape or form. It was just somebody to fill that particular pocket in the lineup. And um Eugene Deal, you know, commented that of all the people in the lineup, that individual looked the most like the Nation of Islam guy that he had seen at the Peterson Auto Museum from the night Biggie was killed. So you know, we take that into consideration that there's this individual, this is an appearance. But the problem was it looked nothing like the actual um, uh, composites that had been done by Little Seeds and G-Money. So, of course, you know, Eugene Deal just giving us his perception of things. This is what the guy looked like. But then years later, of course, during the documentary of Biggie and Tupac, um, you know, he identifies a guy named Harry Phillips. Um, he's real, uh, Amir Mohammed is what he's more commonly known as. Yeah. Who doesn't look anything like the person that he originally said looks like the Nation of Islam guy. So it was just this kind of ongoing, you know, situation where, you know, the uh, Eugene Deal ultimately, when confronted with that, you know, it's like, hey, you picked uh, Amir Mohammed out during this documentary. You said, this is the guy. But he looks nothing like the guy that you originally said looks like the guy. And so he says, you know, Greg, I just misspoke during the, you know, the filming. I didn't intend to say this was the guy. What I intended to do was say, you know, this looks very much like the guy. Not that it is the guy, but it looks like the guy. So, you know, it just kind of tainted the whole thing in so far as his identification goes. And, um, you know, it's nothing, nothing you know, nefarious about that. that I think he's not being completely honest about the way things played out. Yeah, he's, I mean, he's known for kind of when he gets excited, you know, kind of just blabs things out out there. And then, you know, he'll he'll apologize for it later and stuff like that. But, you know, he's he's an all right guy, I think, you know. Um, so uh, was the FBI uh, really following Tupac and Biggie? And if so, uh, why is it that they were not there the night that they both were murdered? And no, there's no surveillance of Tupac um, at all by the FBI. The FBI was conducting an investigation into death row records and racketeering activities. So, you know, they did have death row under their radar, but they weren't specifically surveilling or looking at Tupac's decor. Um, and, uh, but it's, 
far as Biggie goes, yes, there was a task force on the East Coast that was looking at Bad Boy Records because there were some concerns about drugs and guns. You know, if you remember, Biggie's house was raided before they came out here, and there were some guns seized, and there was a concern that the guns might have been coming from the West Coast or the drugs were coming from the West Coast. And there was also a guy that was wanted for murder that was affiliating with Bad Boy. And so this East Coast group of cops um, came out here to L.A. to kind of just see where things led, see what these guys were up to. That Puffy becomes aware of it, that uh, they're under surveillance. And once the cops realized that they were burned, you know, they went back to New York. And that was just prior to the actual shooting in, uh, at the Peterson Auto Museum. Okay. Um, do you know who was the, the man that was wanted for murder on uh, Biggie's crew? I do. I actually have his flyer in the case files, but his name doesn't his name doesn't come to the top of my head. It might have been Hightower or something like that. Maybe Charles Hightower. I can't remember for sure. But okay, that's fine. That. That's fine. Yeah. Um, uh, so you, there are people who think that uh, Dre actually did the you know the shoot in the car. Um, the reason that a lot of people think this is because there's been you know I guess eyewitnesses that said that uh, he was the night after the shooting or the week after the shooting or whatever, uh, Dre was uh, actually boasting or showing off, telling everybody that he was the one that actually did the shooting. And uh, there's actually people in Tupac's family that actually believe that too. Uh, was he ever like a suspect or what do you think about that? Well, sure. I mean, he's a co-conspirator. He's in the car and they know what they're doing. They're going to find Tupac and Biggie. And so they're all part of a conspiracy to commit murder that I don't believe he's the gunman. Um, T. Brown was bragging about it. DeAndre was bragging about it. Orlando was definitely bragging about it. So everybody was kind of trying to take credit for it. But, you know, you've got to understand the mindset of these guys. Orlando Anderson's the one that got um, got stomped. You know, he's got the reputation that he needs to defend. And he's in a position to do the shooting. And he has the motive. And, of course, his uncle verifies that during his confession. So people can speculate it with Dre. But uh, there's nothing really to back it up. Right on, right on, Greg. Um, since you, you know, had, since you've seen all the Biggie files and things like that, is there any files and documents uh, that, or clues, you know, that the FBI, I mean, that the FBI, that the uh, LAPD has not yet made public because, you know, of the fear of more conspiracy theories or more confusion, you know, in the case? Um. Well, there's a lot of, you know, there's the investigative files are thousands, if not tens of thousands of pages. And, you know, so you just can't release all that stuff arbitrarily um, because there's a lot of false information in the investigation. And there's a lot of information that was provided that's inaccurate. And you don't want to just release that stuff recklessly because it uh, can be misinterpreted and it can identify people and um, that uh, weren't involved, that people claim were involved. And so, have to be responsible with what you release. So yeah, there's information, um, but most of the true valuable evidence, the accurate information that's reliable, that's already been released, you know, through Murder App or through the, you know, spoken documentary and stuff. So, um, you know, the, the, the public has the majority of the information um, that one would need to draw a sound conclusion as to what happened. Okay. Um, and um, why didn't the uh, LAPD continue with the investigation after the after police involvement was disproven? Uh, several reasons. One, so much time had passed, and uh, you know, there's been there was issues with witnesses. There's, you know, the triggerman was dead. Um, the girl who was providing information, you know, she was immune from prosecution in the case. And, uh, and then you've got her. You know, there's only a three-person conspiracy at this point in time, her, the shooter, and Suge Knight, and putting her on the stand in front of Suge when she had her own credibility issues, it was going to be a really tough case to prosecute and to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. Because Suge would easily just say, ah, oh, that's my baby mama. She's pissed off at me because I don't pay child support, whatever. This is all made up. And, of course, she's got this whole history of lying about her identification, blah, blah, blah. So they're like, it's a really tough case to prove in court under those circumstances and uh we've spent enough time and effort and manpower so just gonna leave it where it's at okay um so uh 
I have a uh, one of my personal questions that I wanted to ask you. Uh, there was you, you were on an actual show, I think on YouTube, there's a YouTube channel called uh, Mas Master Music Murder Show, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. the Master Music Show. Um, okay. And um, on that YouTube channel, it was actually Michael Carlin that was speaking, and it seemed like like he just kind of popped out of nowhere and just started roasting the guy. Uh, it was awesome. <laughs> Uh, did you actually plan that out, or was that just kind of, you know, or kind of just happened? You just happened to hear him and just called in and, and roasted him. No, I, I was aware that uh, I don't know, you know, somebody had tipped me off. They were either listening to it or, you know, had had previously seen what the the guest was going to be on that show. I can't exactly remember, um, but yeah, I was told that he was going to appear on it, and I thought, okay, well. Let me, uh, let me confront him about some claims that he's making. So I called in and you know, had the conversation that I had. Okay, <laughs> right on. Um, so there's a lot of uh, conspiracy theories that I'm pretty sure you've heard. Um, but one of the ones that you know people seem to actually believe the most for, for, for some reason is that uh, Tupac is actually alive, that he survived, that um, he actually escaped and is actually somewhere right now living and breathing. Uh, is this possible? And if, you know, because you, you, you have worked in uh, law enforcement before and in your, uh, you know, in your experience, is this possible? And if it is, uh, what would Tupac be facing, you know, like any like criminal charges when he comes back or what would happen if he would actually return? Well, it's so improbable that it's impossible. I mean, you, people don't realize the complexity of such an enormous cover-up for so many years involving so many people so it's you know it's just foolish but i understand people um you know have wishful thinking but the reality is it's, it's absurd um uh if you know if for some reason tupac appeared some somewhere in the world there'd be such a massive celebration i don't think law enforcement would really give a <laughs> You know, they'd be like, whatever, hey, check out, drop the bus to life, who's on? So, you know, it's just, it's ridiculous. It's wishful thinking, but I see why people kind of go there because they don't want to accept the idea that he's dead. Yeah, and it's like a lot of people won't come to, you know, the realization that, well, I guess like a lot of people don't think that just a simple gangbang, like a simple gangbanger from L.A. could actually kill Tupac with all the security that he had and all that stuff. So that's probably why they think all that, all those uh, things kind of just like, kind of yeah. like with, uh, with, uh, who, uh, like Elvis and things like when he passed away, a lot of people don't, they don't want to believe that he was actually dead. Oh yeah. Elvis, Bruce Lee, Jim Morrison, you know, all these people are somewhere just, uh, sipping my ties together and laughing about it. Yeah. They're all laughing at us. I agree. <laughs> okay um so with all this uh with all these people claiming you know that puffy was actually you know cool with the Southside crips and orlando anderson and keefe d and things like that um and uh if one day a picture would pop out of nowhere with him and keefe d or him and orlando would that be enough to kind of take him to trial or uh, and try to get him for this for the for the christopher wallace murder i mean for the tupac murder star well, first of all, I think Puffy's smarter than that. He's never going to put himself in a position to exacerbate the problems that uh, have already been made public. Um, then there's no way anybody's going to put an icon like him on trial based on the testimony of a drug dealing ex convict gang member like Keefe D. So Orlando's dead. All the other co conspirators are dead. Half the witnesses are dead. So it'll never happen. It it would never happen. And I don't even think that uh, um, with all that in mind, um, it would to be appropriate. I mean, we've got to go back and kind of understand what took place, why it unfolded the way it did, what Puffy's mindset was, what threat and fear was he under. So none of that justifies being involved in the murder conspiracy, but there's a lot to think about. And uh, uh, But these cases are done. They'll never go anywhere. Yeah. Um, so what's your favorite Tupac song, Greg? You know, 
that's tough. I'm not a rap fan, to be, you know, I'm, I, I became familiar and appreciated his music through the investigation, but it wasn't like I was a fan before that. It wasn't my style of music that I listened to. Um, but as cliche as it sounds, I love Dear Mama just because it's so deep, it's so meaningful, and it resonates for me personally um, because of, you know, circumstances in my own life. So uh, I love that song just because I can close my eyes and, and, uh, appreciate the, the the genuineness of it yeah that's a great song I'm, i i think every male would love that song for their mom because you know we all love our mom right uh all right uh, on an interview you mentioned that uh you wish you could uh, have spoken to the tupac community sooner um what do you think would have happened different if you would have done that well you know, in hindsight, all these people, you know, would be contacting me and sharing stories and information and, and even some leads and stuff that would have maybe helped us to maybe take some other approaches or to contact some other people. Um, it would have been nice to know that this community, to a certain extent, avails themselves to, to helping to solve the case. You know, they're not just sitting back waiting for the police to do it. Um, although they kind of are forced to accept that reality. But, you know, there's a lot of people out there who want to bring closure to it and um, and uh, provide information. And, you know, I just wish I had known about how intact and um, passionate the community was at the time I was conducting the investigation. Right on, Greg. Um, can you sing to us any part of Dear Mama? Can you rap to us any part of Dear Mama? <laughs> Not a chance, man. <laughs> right on, Greg. Uh, <laughs> well, Greg, again, I just want to thank you, brother, uh, and tell you You're that you, uh, that I really appreciate you doing this, man. Like I told you last time, um, you know, uh, love your movies. You know, it brought a lot of closure. Not, I think not only to me, but to millions of people, man, because I think we already kind of knew what happened. But we kind of needed somebody in law enforcement to kind of go, look, this would happen. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Uh, right. And, um, yeah, you know, that we want to say thank you for that, or I guess I want to say thank you for that. Um, and uh, thank you for doing this interview. You didn't have to do this, man. Uh, thank you uh, for taking time out of your busy day. And um, sure. and we will go ahead and give you a call back some other day, brother, and speak to you again, my friend. Okay, man. You're surely welcome. It's been my pleasure, and I, I appreciate you too, man. All right, Bray. Have a good day. All right. You too. All right. Bye. How's it going, my people? It's your boy, Wired Up, and welcome to another episode of Wired Up TV. This is the Roach. My Roach is getting small without you guys. Sorry, guys. I had to smoke without y'all. <laughs> I told y'all. There you guys have it. The episode of Great Caden interview. Please, guys, stay tuned for the Gonzo interview and also the Reggie Wright Jr. interview coming this week. Probably Monday, guys. Um, I got some shout outs. You know, t to call or to shout out or whatever the fuck. Um, I want to thank all my subscribers and all my people that watch my videos. I do it for y'all. Thank y'all. I told y'all this show's about you. I try to answer all the comments and talk to all you guys because y'all my family. So here's a shout out to Sunrise, a.k.a. Mr. Machiavelli. Sunrise, a.k.a. Mr. Machiavelli. Thanks, dog. This guy's been a viewer and a subscriber from day one. I'm talking about day one. <laughs> Man, much love, much respect, dog. I do it for y'all, man. Um, then, of course, Fats from Ireland. Fats from Ireland. I hope I'm saying it right. I'm still going to post you guys' uh, little icon things on the screen. Fats from Ireland and Sunrise, a.k.a. Mr. Machiavelli. Fats from Ireland. Thank you for watching my show all the way from Ireland. Shout out to all, to all of Ireland. Much love, much respect from Wired Up TV. I love y'all. Y'all my family. Now, um... Thanks to Mr. Greg Caden. He did not have to do this shit. You know what I'm saying? We have done it before, like I said, but we had some technical difficulties on my side, on my end. But he did it. He's a man of his word, and he don't run from shit. <laughs> Even if you guys don't believe in his uh, theory, we should show much respect to this man, guys. Because he'll do anything and speak to anybody from the Tupac community. So, guys, I want to say thank you. Stay tuned. Please subscribe. Please hit the like button. And please comment. Let me know what questions you want me to ask Reggie and Gonzo. And I, will ask, and I will ask them for you guys. Please let me know any good questions, guys, that have never been asked. All right, guys. Like I said, have a good day. Keep your hand on the fucking steering wheel, guys. Keep positive. 
Don't let nobody tell you that you can't do nothing. Don't let nobody put any negative thoughts in your head. And don't uh, go straight off the road, guys. Because I worry about you guys. Like I said, you guys are my family. So again, guys, have a great day. Be careful. If you're going to smoke, smoke peacefully at home. And have a blessed day, guys. And like always, guys, like always, y'all better stay wired up. Peace.